Tommy Bolin was a natural, a self-taught, driven by desire, jazz fusion guitarist with influences in all genres of music. His composition, Ode to G, recorded with Deep Purple, was a tribute to George Gershwin. In short, Tommy Bolin was a fireball of energy and talent that could play any style of music he wanted to and do it with the best of them. He could also party with the best of them, and sadly, in the early morning hours of December 4th, at the young age of 25, in a hotel room in Miami, Florida, he died. Could his death have been prevented that night? And that's up for debate, and we'll do just that later on in the video. But first, let's take a look back on his life and musical journey, which includes two albums with the group Zephyr, two solo albums, a couple more albums with the James Gang, four songs on drummer Billy Cobham's debut album, Spectrum. He also replaced Richie Blackmore in Deep Purple and worked on an album with them while working on his own solo music at the time. For as short of a time as he was here, Tommy Bowen probably accomplished more than any guitarist I can think of. Tommy Richard Bowen was born in Sioux City, Iowa on August 1st, 1951. He started out at an early age with the piano and drums, but at age 10 he got his first guitar and he started his love affair with the instrument. After playing in a few small local bands, Tommy got a gig in a more professional act in 1964 with a group called Denny and the Triumphs. He was just 13 years old at the time. This just shows how good Tommy already was on the guitar. The band would later be renamed A Patch of Blue and were professional enough to land opening slots on shows with the likes of the Beach Boys, the Animals, and Herman's Hermits. Now during this time with the Patch of Blue, Tommy would also perform with a three-piece group called the Chateaus. Tommy filled out the sound in this group, switching between guitar and Hammond organ. He would do this up until 1967 when he was let go by the Patch of Blue for playing too loud. Probably, in all honesty, Tommy had just outgrown the band. After that, he would be expelled from high school for refusing to cut his hair and move off to Boulder, Colorado and found a gig playing in a band called American Standard in 1967. This was an important early step in Tommy's career as it introduced him to the band singer Jeff Cook, who sang and co-wrote with Tommy in the following years. And it also put some money in his pocket because soon American Standard became the house band at the Family Dog Nightclub in Denver. There, Tommy would meet the nightclub's manager, Barry Fay. Later, he would become Tommy's manager for a time. In early 1968, American Standard broke up and supposedly Tommy took off for Cincinnati and played a few gigs with Lonnie Mack and then formed a group called the Ginger People with a keyboard player named John Ferris. This was when Tommy came back to Colorado along with John Ferris. They would stick together. This would mark the beginning of Tommy's first taste of the big time as the pair would hook up with two musicians from Boulder who'd recently been in a band called Brown Sugar. Their names, Candy and David Givens, a husband and wife team, and they would pull together to form the group Zephyr. Tommy Bowen was 17 years old at this time. The band would put out two albums and hit the stage in a big way, opening for the likes of Led Zeppelin Jethro Tull and Jimi Hendrix. The band's self-titled first album was released in 1969. Recording it was not a very good experience. The production and the band, irritated by multiple takes, brought on a personnel change in May 1970 when drummer Robbie Chamberlain was asked to leave. The decision ultimately contributed to the band's breakup the following year. They would hire Tommy's friend, Bob Berge, to play drums. And although Tommy really liked his style, I don't think the other members were fond of it. They would release their second album with Berge on drums titled Going Back to Colorado. And although this album was considered better than the debut album, the band just wasn't seeing eye to eye. It would end up with Tommy and Berge leaving to form the band Energy. 
It seemed like in the 70s, Tommy was playing with a new band every year after Zephyr. Energy in 72 and 73, and then he played with Billy Cobham in mid-1973. Then he jumped to the James Gang in August of 73, until around October of 74. Then he finally started working on his solo career. But when the opportunity to take over for Richie Blackmore and the group Deep Purple came along, he took that on in June of 1975, while keeping up working on his solo album. He kept up a very hectic pace the last five or six years of his life. It was during this time with energy that Tommy's drug use started to escalate. And by the time he got in with the James Gang, he was getting way over the top with it. It would be the contributing factor in ending his life just a few short years later, which we'll discuss here shortly. The James Gang bass player said that Tommy had a horrible, unbelievable drug problem. But that wasn't the issue that caused his split with them. It had to do with the music. Tommy never was real fond of the rock bluesy style of music of the band. And after a couple of albums, he decided to start out on his solo career and work on his own style, the music he loved. Tommy was quoted saying, I replaced Walsh and I replaced Blackmore. Now I just gotta be me. Well, that isn't exactly all true. Though he did replace Blackmore, Joe Walsh had already left the James Gang and it was Dominic Troiano who had replaced Joe on guitar and that didn't work too well for the band. So it was Dominic who Tommy actually replaced. Joe was out in Colorado at the time working on his album with his band, Barnstorm. Right after leaving the James Gang, Tommy would do a little session work also, most notably with the Canadian band Moxie as lead guitarist on six songs from their debut album. Eventually, Tommy would sign a record deal with the Emperor Records as a solo artist, and he would begin recording his first album. Tommy used quite a few artists in making of this album, including David Sanborn, Stanley Sheldon, Jan Hammer, Glenn Hughes, Phil Collins, and many more. But as he was finishing it up, and at a time when he should be getting ready to go out and promote the album, he got the phone call about coming to work with Deep Purple. Although Tommy desperately wanted a solo career of his own, the money and status of playing with a huge act like Deep Purple was simply too much to pass up. Now remember, this was back in a time when getting out and touring to promote your album was extremely necessary for album sales. There was no MTV or internet, and although I'm sure the money and exposure was good for Tommy, it hurt his solo album sales. This album called Teaser, it's a great album. It shows off the broad range of styles in Tommy's playing. The material spans hard rock, blues rock, jazz, reggae, and Latin music, often blending these styles together within a single song. It's considered by many to be the greatest recordings of his short career. Tommy would work on one album with Deep Purple and begin working on his second and last album titled Private Eyes. But from the accounts of many, his drug abuse was out of control by now. He was dropped by the Emperor Records and his longtime friend and manager, Barry Fay, was able to get Tommy signed with Columbia. His new label pushed hard to make him a headline act, but sadly, no effort was made to address his obvious drug problem. They did work on getting him a more conventional rock album, which was an attempt by Columbia to get Tommy more FM radio play. It did accomplish that, as Post Toasty, Shake the Devil, and Bustin' Out for Rosie all became FM rock staples. But Tommy was out of control. There are so many stories of him falling off stage, not being coherent enough to play a show, passing out before and after shows. To be brutally honest, he was just a mess. His death came as not a shock to many who knew him. Could his death have been prevented that night? Sure, it could have, but the ones hired to take care of him had to worry more about Tommy's career and the bad publicity that calling an ambulance and getting him to the hospital would bring than worrying about his life. And that's not an uncommon thing back then. Keith Richards survived many of them. 
There's no telling how many times Elvis Presley's bodyguards and girlfriends brought him back before he finally did himself in. December 3rd, 1976, Tommy Boland's band opened for Jeff Beck at a show in Miami, Florida. Everyone at the show remembers his performance was inspired, and Tommy closed his set with a rousing performance of Post Toasties. After the show, at the Newport Hotel, around 2 in the morning, while talking on the phone, Tommy suddenly collapsed. A friend there with him called the room of his bodyguard, Elsie Clayton, for help. Elsie, Tommy's guitar tech, a roadie, and Tommy's current girlfriend ran down to his room. They threw Tommy in the shower to bring him back around. His bodyguard asked his friend who was there with him what drugs he had done. And the friend said he'd run up some heroin. He later changed the story that Tommy had just snorted it. Tommy had also been drinking earlier at the hotel bar then probably during, before, and after his show. It didn't take them too long working on Tommy in the shower and he started coming back around and the color returned to his face so they put him to bed. About an hour later, his guitar tech called the emergency hotel number and spoke to the hotel doctor and said Tommy had taken Valium and had been drinking and that they couldn't wake him up. The doctor told him they needed to get him to the hospital or he could possibly die. Around this time, Tommy came to and mumbled something. So to his guitar tech, he seemed to be coming around and okay. So sadly, a call was never placed to summons an ambulance at that time. And a few hours later, they all left the room, leaving Tommy in the care of his girlfriend, who would call the ambulance early the next morning after his pulse rate dropped. The ambulance arrived, but Tommy Bowen, at the age of 25, was dead by the time they got there. The cause of death was an overdose of heroin. Although the medical examiner's report showed that he had ingested a lethal cocktail of drugs consisting of cocaine, barbiturates, and alcohol. As I said, his death could probably have been prevented that night had they called the ambulance sooner and maybe saved Tommy's life at that time. But had he lived, would he have woke up and saved himself from himself? That we'll never know. Here's a couple more videos you might enjoy on the channel. Let me hear your thoughts on Tommy Boland's life and his music in the comments section. And don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And thanks y'all for watching. I appreciate it.